our lives are actually really deep and profound experiences and complex and rich and nuanced and wonderful and challenging. But we have to really be careful to pay attention and show up. Otherwise, you might miss it. It's Kara Golden, and welcome to the Kara Golden Show. I am so excited to have my next guest here, Benjamin Wagner, who is the co-producer of the award-winning Mr. Rogers and Me, the PBS documentary, but also so much more. And I met Benjamin and was obviously just enamored with what he had co-produced, but just got to know him and his journey and it was so incredible to hear. I'll give you just a couple of hints on sort of other stuff that he's done along the way. As I said, he co-produced the endearing and award-winning documentary about the iconic Mr. Rogers. Uh, his film covers the positive influence that Mr. Rogers had on people's lives. And what was so special about his relationship was he was actually Mr. Rogers' neighbor. And that's pretty crazy in and of itself. Benjamin recently left his role at that little company, Facebook, (laughs) uh, after six years where he was hired to launch the Facebook journalism project globally. And he did lots of other stuff, including large scale events, uh, as well as Facebook Media Central, Facebook Live. And prior to that, This is where I got a little crazy (laughs) because this is my generation. He spent 18 years at MTV News, transforming it into a 24-7 digital network, which, again, coming from uh, I was at CNN at the time when, you know, news was was kind of something besides the 6 and 10 o'clock news Mm -hmm. and uh, MTV was just kind of really getting moving. So I've uh, I've watched that entire progress that you had really developed along the way. And I'm just uh, gaga over over that aspect of your journey, too. But but more than anything, I just think hearing on this podcast from founders and CEOs and often times just really cool people that have done really great stuff that is super inspiring, um, co-producers of award-winning win- films, as well as uh, people who have just launched kind of mini businesses within large businesses is yeah. really what we're all about. right? Yeah. Ex- exactly. So welcome, Benjamin oh, Wagner. You. So excited. I, I'm tickled pink. Oh, you're... Uh, you're uh you're great to be here. So you seem to be able to well let's let's start here. Where did this all start for little Benjamin? Oh, great question. Uh, you know, uh, my family's from the Midwest, so there's a uh from Iowa. And so there's a real sort of sense of that middle the openness, all that, you know, the things that I, I connect with the Midwest. But I was raised in the Northeast. Um, my folks divorced when I was about 10, and we moved to uh, suburban Philly. So I got a little bit of both. But writing is really where it all starts, right? The ability to kind of get down thoughts in words and then sort of expressing it in music and figuring out how to express it visually. So it really started early. I mean, I always was writing in journals and you know, making little books and that sort of thing. I first performed in fifth grade in a talent show in which my brother and I had actually made our first film. I was singing the theme to The Greatest American Hero. Do you remember that show at all? I do William remember that. Cat, yeah, yeah. blonde, curly hair. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, there's a tiny bit of it in the very beginning of Mr. Rogers and Me, but you'd never know the context. You just think it's me and Chris goofing around. But it was me and Chris making a movie that we played behind me as I performed. So, in a lot of ways, it all kind of connects. Then I started flipping over boxes and putting typewriters on them and pretending I was in a newspaper. Then I actually started working in newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really organic, but I think it starts with communication, expression, you know, trying to figure stuff out. 
That's I love it. So I, I read that you've been writing since you were 15, but it sounds like you were even writing before then. I mean, yeah, it that's just like professionally. You, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My first I mean, job was uh, writing sports for the local paper and then, you know, the college paper and managing the high school paper and then going to work for radio. Um, and, you know, that fluidity between media ended up being really useful when I graduated college right as the Internet was born. Because if somebody didn't really understand some guy in marketing or some guy vice president somewhere was like, I don't know this online thing, but I think it's marketing or it's media or something. And they get to hire a guy who could write and who understand, understood visuals and who had a sort of a different kind of language. Um, that was pretty useful. So it was, and I also had a Mac, which didn't hurt, mm -hmm. right? I was just an early adopter there. Thank goodness. I did as well. I was I a bet. journalist. Yeah. I was a journalism major and what I, I always share with people I used my waitressing money to buy my first iMac and oh my it was and you know I was in the in the dorm with my iMac and was uh people were like what is that and I I mean I could have been a sales rep for for no doubt. Apple at that point because people were just mesmerized by it the design the you know smallness of it it was just everything and it had this cute little apple on it too it's uh you know you you were living it too and i didn't want to put white out into my tape, typewriter anymore i had to be cleaning my keys with alcohol whenever yeah. I was trying to write a paper and it was just awful i mean the experience was terrible and that's what i thought about about the iMac I love that you have had an iMac that feels just the moment you said that I was like, it's so perfect for you because it's colorful and it's kind of poppy and gregarious, right? I had an SE40, which was like oh. the second generation. It's still a box, you know, but it's, it's elegant. You can pick it up and carry it. It's like getting there. I mean, this is probably 90, you know, 80 uh, yeah. or whatever. Um, but I, it's, you know, they re it's true though. There is, it seems to me, some relationship between the intuitive nature the sort of WYSIWYG nature of, of, of Mac versus PC. But then I might not know because I never really got stuck with a PC, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. That's, that's wild. So you mentioned a couple of times the word music. Mm -hmm. And so how did music play into life and how did those two intersect for you, the writing yeah. and music was in the house. I mean, so I was, um, my mom in particular, but my folks were listening to the Beatles. You know, I'm talking early seventies was when my ears were waking up. So it was Beatles and James Taylor and John Denver and like singer songwriter Carol King, you know, which is really generally soothing, contemplative, reflective stuff. Right. So mm -hmm. which came first, the, uh, the music of the misery, <laughs> that line from high fidelity. But I said that was always in the air. And my mom is a great piano player and she was playing acoustic guitar learning when I was in the womb. So it's almost like it was impossible for me not to love that sound of an acoustic guitar, which is the foundation of all the records I've ever put out, even though they're rock records. And so it was always present. You know, I took piano lessons and kind of played by ear. I sang in everything I could. I, I did plays. And then I got recruited into a band and I was like, you know, a rock band in high school. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a different feeling altogether because you've got drums, bass and electric guitars and Let's be honest, the audience responds very differently to a, a rock show than a musical, right? Maybe yeah. less these days, but um, so there was all those things. There was the personal expression. There was this sort of rebellion that's built into rock and roll, valid or not. There was the idea that it moved other people and that they, you know, reinforced it positively with applause and so forth. That's a great feeling. And then it became an opportunity to very rapidly, I think I, and the, the first talent show I played in high school, we sang one of my songs, you know, or our songs that I wrote the lyrics to. But um, it becomes a, a means of not so much expression, but I find uh, understanding because the songwriting process is kind of like divination in some way. You're really just trying to get out of your own way. Like any ideation, I think you're really just kind of trying to not let the critic in your own brain get in between you and what could happen because anything could happen in a way. Right. Um, yeah. And so songwriting often just lets my intuition and unconscious unspool in a really organic way. And then over time it begins to make sense. You know, you talk about connecting the dots. I only really understand my music in retrospect and often over time. And I, I would bet that's true for many, but that's just 
That's my, my thing. And it became intersected with journalism very specifically courtesy of Jan Wenner and Rolling Stone. Um, when I was flying back and forth between parents, I would, I picked up a copy of Rolling Stone when I was, you know, mm. 10 or 11. And I immediately was like, Oh, they're, they're young. I mean, you know, pop stars are like 24, you know, so it wasn't wholly unrelatable to, at whatever age. But moreover, they wear their dysfunction, at least at that time. And certainly in that magazine, it's kind of a trope. You know, it's kind of like the Rolling Stone cover story is like, let me sit on a couch in a nice hotel and unspool what's bothering me. And you're, we're going to work it out together and we're going to leave in a different place. Right. And so I felt, I think, at home with that sense of feelings that, you know, there may be some misunderstanding. I may be puzzling through some things. You know, this is I'm flying back and forth between parents like this is a challenging time. And so it became a place, I think, of escape and expression, and again, of reasoning and puzzling and making sense. And then as soon as I saw Rolling Stone existed, well, it became very easy to know what I wanted to do, right? Until yeah. I saw MTV News, right? Yeah. Which came just a tiny bit later. And then it was crystal clear what I wanted to do. And uh, my father tells me, because when I got the job, I was like, I never thought this would be possible. He goes, you've been talking about it your whole life. I was like, really? So I guess it was um, really high on my list of things to do re really quickly, you know? Were you a fan of MTV before you? Oh, big time. Yeah. 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 You loved um, it. And I mean, that's, I, I talk about MTV as, you know, you and I are, are of the same yeah. generation where it was just, it was game changing. I mean, it we was a cultural there, force. It was a disruptor, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, and was we a would, it disrupted the visual medium. It disrupted advertising. It disrupted, obviously, the music business. I would argue it disrupted what do you call it? The QSR business, you know, it, it, cause, cause it just suddenly became this whole new universe of yeah. culture. Right. But I just liked, you know, I liked seeing Tom Petty pretend he was in Mad Max, you know, or seeing Madonna in Italy. I just, it was as far away as my imagination in some ways could take me um, within the context of reality, because they were real people versus yeah. reading, you know, a fantasy story or a piece of fiction that was, was, was not true. And for me, I always wanted to get underneath the the music video or the gloss or the photo shoot i want to be like no but what what's the lyric about what's the title about what's the issue what is he or she wrestling with i love it which by the way is i think my core competency on earth at least it's the thing i'm still really most passionate about you know well and that's your curiosity right i mean i yeah. think that that is that's that you know you always have it you're not really sure how you're going to use it, but when you do use it, it all sort of rolls back to, it's always been there, Yeah. but when you need to use it, and it's crazy to me sometimes when I think about curiosity is what differentiates mm -hmm. industries, people, it, it really just boils down to it. A hundred percent. And I found that it's actually like many things, a decision to some degree, right? Uh -huh. Because you're not naturally going to be curious about everything. Let's just, let me just be clear with you. Have I managed budgets? Yes. Am I curious about them? Not really. Right. Um, am I curious about the universe? Am I curious about why my brain works like it does? Why I respond to a camera different than eyeballs, whatever, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And I've found the more I cultivate curiosity, like noticing, right, being outside and noticing or being in relationship and noticing that it's like a muscle that I'm getting a little bit, a little bit better at it. Um, and so then you can leverage that curiosity and kind of point it at things like a laser beam, you know. I love that. That's so yeah. great. So you, so you get you're you're there for a measly uh, 18 years and, and doing uh which is, I know, crazy. I don't even, I feel like MTV doesn't make sense to a lot of audiences because its heyday is so past, which, by the way, was part of my, like, heads up that it was time to go. I was like, it's really time. But it also tells you something about my loyalty and commitment. And I really, I was oh, really? so committed to helping. There was so, I was there so long when I was just like, if we could just do these things, you know, and then finally I got the chance to do some of the things. And once you get that chance and you can see the impact your ideas and your collaboration, the team building makes, you're like, it's a, you're hooked, right? Yeah. So that's and part of the reason, but 18 years. I mean, I grew up there, you know, I was yeah. a kid and I started and I still feel like a kid, but I definitely was not a kid when I left. <laughs> Incredible. So you, uh, six years, you just left Facebook. Actually, yeah. when you and I were talking, you hadn't even done that yet. So no, that's it's, right. uh, 
And, uh, and as I mentioned, it was earlier, incubating, make no mistake, obviously. Right. right. Talk to us a little bit about what you were doing there. Uh, I mean, I, I listen, I, I had a ball at Facebook. Um, I, I did a ton of things. You know, one of the coolest components of, of taking a gig there is it's going to change every second of every day. And it's certainly mm-hmm. going to change, you know, the, the company or, uh, operates around a half system, right? So you're certainly looking at resetting the organizational sort of um, strategy or at least tactics, operational processes all the time, which is either really disruptive or really exciting, right? Depending on kind of how, what your approach is. I found it enormously instructive because it helped me to understand that that was something I was attracted to and trying to do previously, but hadn't, didn't really have the cultural language or the tools or the processes for it. So I did a bunch of things, but like you said, I, I was, I, I started doing in essence editorial and production oriented functions just as those sorts of, of needs were arising. And some of the first things I worked on was we did a media partner center called Facebook Media Central in New York. That was a place where public figures, um, uh, you know, celebrities, so forth would come in, learn how to use uh, Facebook and Instagram and the tools, get a sense of the culture. In, in essence, I, I became a, a kind of the, a people person and there were a number of people persons, right? That aren't on the product per se, but they're on the relationship between the entities using the products. So Facebook Media Central, I helped Chris Cox launch Facebook Live. He, by the way, Really wanted to talk about Sway Calloway and Kurt Loder from MTV yeah. News, which is really fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I did a lot it. on Facebook Live, uh, all kinds of events, um, elections, uh, conventions all around the world. And then, um, I, I've always been in news partnerships. Um, so, uh, I got to help launch the Facebook Journalism Project, um, with Campbell Brown and Anya Kerr and a whole bunch of, you know, brilliant, wonderful people and just travel the world. And I'm, there's always a part of me, Kara, that's a kid from Iowa, just like our mutual friend, Craig. I think there's always like a kid from Rhode Island. And, you know, to wake up in Kuala Lumpur with a little Facebook button on your lapel is, a, yeah. you know, a neat moment. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It's <laughs> so kind it of fun. Was just, I... It was spectacular. That's awesome. I love it. So now the main event. So <laughs> let's turn to the documentary yeah. you co-produced with your brother, uh, Mr. Rogers and me. And I had seen it prior to you sending it over to me. And it was absolutely so incredible. Oh, if you, you those listening haven't seen it, you should absolutely watch it. But give us the a bit of the background. Yeah, 100 percent. So. Mr. Roger Summert in a modest gray shake shingle house on the edge of Nantucket Island. And my mother rented a tiny cottage next door. So Mr. Rogers really was my neighbor. That is, you may recall the actual beginning of the film. Um, You know, my mom had been going to Nantucket um, for years uh, just to, you know, sit on the porch and read books and stuff. And Nantucket's a fancy town, but where, where she has historically gone is Thoroughly unfancy, nothing special, sand streets, lovely, beautiful and quiet. And as it ends up, um, one afternoon, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers said hello to her on the beach. And I think she had known that his house was in that neighborhood of the island. It's called Madikin. And she was getting a, a theology degree at the time. He is an ordained Presbyterian, was an ordained Presbyterian minister. So obviously they had rapport. As all parents do, she, um, you know, bragged about her kids, I guess. And she called the next day and said, you know, you'll never believe who I, who I met. And, you know, he'd love to meet you guys. You should come out. And so I, yeah, I pretty immediately went out to Nantucket to, to say hello to my mother. And, you know, it's frankly just a ferry ride from New York City. It's not impossible. Uh, and I was, it was my 30th birthday and sitting there, you know, this is back in the age of blackberries, which you also remember. It's still vibrating. It's VMA season, by the way. So everybody wants to talk video music awards, but I'm on vacation and. Mr. Rogers walks over the dune and says, you must be the birthday boy, you know, and it kind of all gets magical and beautiful from there. In essence, he gave us a tour of his house, me and, and my mom, and I uh, played some music for him and he, I just felt very at home. He's super authentic as, as you, you mentioned, very present. And, um, I was alone with him in his study and he said, um, unprompted, Tell me about your parents' divorce, you know, out of the blue. Now, I suspect he and my mother discussed it, but he, he was, and, and the, the, so fast forward, I have now talked to hundreds of people about their one-to-one encounters with Mr. Rogers, well, whether brief or of any duration. 
And to a person, they they tell a story like this where they were disarmed by his radical sort of presence and engagement and sort of commitment to being with you in that moment, in that experience, but That's also awesome. his ability to get right at the stuff that he intuited was maybe blocking you. Yeah. So, you know, it was a really moving, really moving experience. And what did you say? Like, what what did you say? I mean, you guys are listening oh, gosh, to music. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, hanging out. And uh... I was embarrassed. I was a little embarrassed. And I, and I, and I, I owned it gently in the film. And, you know, I mean, again, track this with me. I, I felt, you know, I did music news at MTV because for me as a young person, uh, knowing what artists were up to and moreover, knowing what was behind their art was really meaningful to me. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. but also MTV news covered news for young people at the time. But outside of that, there was a lot of junk on that channel. And generally media is a lot of Junk, you know, certainly large mainstream media. Like, like, let me rephrase junk. You know, let's say low in healthy calories and high in, you know, uh, you know, sound and fury signifying nothing. Right. So, um, I just thought it was uh, a real opportunity with him to really talk about. I'm a little uncomfortable with what I do and I'd like to do something that's a little more meaningful, you know, and I kind of intimated that. And, and he said that the line that really anchors sort of our investigation or interrogation of, of the meaning of the man in his work, which is he said, you know, Benjamin, <laughs> we're staring out at the Madikit Bay where he swam like a mile a day every day, every time he was there. And he said, uh, I feel so strongly that deep and simple is far more essential than shallow and complex, right? So he talked about this idea that like dominant culture is actually largely, let's call it complex sugars and empty calories, but you know, his mission Right. And this was PBS's mission. And you've probably seen some of those clips yeah. where he's talking about PBS in the early days was well, how can we use it to connect people meaningfully, to educate them, to uplift them, right, to create a sense of community in our towns and in our in our country and in our world. And I, that, I think, is work that you can tell really it excites me and excites me still. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I was so excited to go to Facebook. Right. This idea of connection. Uh-huh. What you and I are doing now, right? Um, it's just something magic that happens when two people really get present with one another. And he showed me that, you know. And so when I told him how meaningful that was to me, bear in mind, I, you know, you, you'll recall this, but for, for your listeners and viewers, um, this was uh, just a few days before September 11th. So, you know, that whole year afterwards and then some was really flummoxing for so many people, right? It was a confounding time. And I told yeah. him how meaningful what he had said was to me and he leans in and he says spread the message hmm. right like yeah I, and, then, and I, he's you know, just met you and he, right yeah, this and is a year like, later so he's, we've exchanged three letters but he barely knows me and i'm like what do you mean you've got a thousand shows on pbs i'm a kid who works at mtv but here look what we're talking about 20 years later right and it's it's, it's 20 years and, and and that's just such it's not just a testimony to him but it's, of course it is but I think it's a testimony to the power of just this reminder that our lives are actually really deep and profound experiences and complex and rich and nuanced and wonderful and challenging. But we have to really be careful to pay attention and show up. Otherwise, you might miss it, you know, as yeah. Ferris Bueller reminded us in a different context altogether. So, you know, we went on to make a movie, as you know. We spent a couple more years uh, after he passed away, which was a surprise to us, obviously, um, my brother and I. And more than co-produced, you ready for this? We, I wrote it. Chris and I uh, lit and shot everything. Uh, Chris cut it. My big brother edited the whole thing. We had one guy, a buddy of ours, do sound. We had one guy, a buddy of ours, do some other, you know, light polishing. But it was really Chris and me. And then we managed, you know, to self. This is so entrepreneurial, right? We, we just did festivals. We figured out festivals. And then I randomly met somebody who was at PBS and she, she was like, I figured you'd sold it already. And I said, no, but I'd like to, you know, and, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of viewers later pledge drives, like, and it was, it was early. This is in 2010. We premiered our film in 2012. It premiered on PBS. It wasn't until four or five years ago that the other documentary came out and the Tom Hanks movie. I'm not claiming any credit. I just, I just was passionate about it. And I'm just as passionate about it today and just as passionate about theirs. But it was pretty, it just still surprises me that we pulled it off. 
Um, but you know, we were uniquely positioned at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I was yeah. at MTV and Chris at its, uh, major, major programs for ESPN and, you know, Comedy Center, you name it. So it helped. That's, that's wild. I mean, I, I think I would have been stopped in my track. I mean, I remember Mr. Rogers, like so many other people as just being really powerful, uh, when I was younger. But I think as I, yeah. I mean, to some extent, even that, that quote that you have about the deep and simple is far more essential yeah. than shallow and complex. It's like we're almost forced by society to go and be shallow and complex in some ways, not to blame it, but it's sort of the, the direction that we head in, you know, go find yeah. lots of friends, right? Go, to, uh, go uh, try and become a, you know, manager, a director, uh, right? That there's this course Yet, I think that going back to even the deep and simple stuff really points to what do you want to do? What, how does this yeah. make you feel? And it's, it's kind of early stuff that if you think way, way back when I had probably, frankly, maybe like some other people, poo pooed them when I got to a, a sure. point where so I was uncool. like a little too old, right? Not of cool course. anymore. It wasn't MTV, but right. you still kind of remember you know, the lessons and how he made people feel, right? And I think that that's just so incredibly powerful. I agreed. And, you know, that contrast, of course, um, this idea of a PBS mind in an MTV world helped make that. I think every time I called somebody and explained for an interview and explained what I did for my day job, they were like, why are you interested in this story? So that was yeah. an advantage. It's sort of a artificial binary. Um, but at the same time, like in every conversation I've ever had about the man, it, it softens people. It opens people. And, you know, I just think it's a, for me, it's the only way to live this idea of like, I'm going to go ahead and take the risk of trusting you with some feelings or some thoughts or some ideas that I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to respect and appreciate, but you might not, but I'm going to be present with you through that. Right. And I just don't know how else to be, but he gave me or, he catalyzed in me the courage to be more myself, if that makes sense. And I think, uh, again, most of the people who had any engagement with him, whether it was through the camera or in person, would say the same thing. And his whole thing was, well, you got to love yourself before you can love your neighbor. And to your previous point, I would argue there's something about the pace of culture and the idea that we need to consume in order to be happy. We are certainly told the more we consume, the more we have the more adventures, you know, the more Instagram photos, the happier we'll be. But I mean, you know, especially as a parent, you know, that most of the things that are advertised for happiness don't really have anything to do with the things that truly move us in profound ways. Right. Or as a spouse or as a friend, you know, but certainly parent drive drove that one home for me. So I, I just think for me, it's again, back to noticing if I can just notice what forces are at play, because over time, at some advertising can sort of be like, well, do I need that makeup or is it a problem that I'm bald? Should I join their hair club? You know, as opposed to like, bro, this is just who you are, it's how this you is are. This is your yeah, and, and that's fine. That's enough. You know, and, and I wonder, I wonder if maybe we would, some of this polarization we're experiencing in the country, the tumult, the real, you know, divide again, whether it's being, there's some hype from the media or not, this, this sense, I wonder if that has something to do with our own, cultural self-esteem, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of like, well, it's possible that we're all a little bit off track with like what really matters and how we ground ourselves in that. And I think the pandemic brought a lot of us home. I know it did me, in, pun not intended, by the way, into really getting closer to that and going, oh, like, you'll love this. So um, my daughter, Elsie, just the other night, and it's a school night. This is not normally allowed. Said, so do you want to go play catch? We started in the backyard, but I was like, let's go down to the park because we need more room. You're doing great. I mean, you know, when I was traveling around the world, Kara, I didn't get those moments, right? Yeah. And those moments, they kind of are advertised, you know, but generally speaking, those aren't the moments that you, you know, they don't get captured in cinema, but you know, you're an author. Those are the little moments that you try and capture and that we talk about because they're just so grounded in the stuff that makes it all worthwhile. And I'm so interested in that. What is that stuff? How do we do more of that stuff? How do we share those stories? How do we gather tools for managing the uncertainty of every day? 
and, and, and learn them from each other so that we can both be more connected, help each other through. I'm obviously a big believer that like, this is a community. We're neighbors. Like, I got you. That's our, that's my job. That's my responsibility towards you. And how can we keep, keep, you know, spreading the message really, you know? That's the thing. He, he asked me to spread the message. I got work to do. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I think that that is so, it's just your documentary is so memorable as oh, I was, you. you know, watching it and you could just see that. I mean, again, that, that level of curiosity too, but also just discovery, all the interviews that you do throughout and how people, as you said, how he made people feel. To it really person, is right? pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is. It, you can replicate it, right? It's just asking people about getting an understanding of who they are top level, but actually going deeper with people mm -hmm. because I just think that that's, that that is something that not a lot of people do. I always talk about when I switch from the tech industry into the, you know, healthy lifestyle or beverage mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. everybody was a little thrown off because I think people work to define you as that guy who's an executive at MTV, all that yes. being cool, but who is he and how does he respond to people? How does he make people feel? I think is, you know, something that at, in the end, I think that's what you are known for. Right. And yeah. I think that that is really what they feel. I'm, th I'm thinking as you're talking, my dad successful executive, you know, started healthy choice was, was yeah. dad of five kids at his funeral. Uh, there were a whole bunch of people that he, he was always, as much as he traveled, he always coached baseball and a little bit football, but always coached baseball. That's and, awesome. and the people like we, I didn't even think at his funeral that people mm -hmm. would come back and talk about him being a coach. And he wasn't the nicest coach in the world. Like he would make the kids skip the, you know, school fair and, and have practice, especially if they had lost. Like, I mean, he was, he was not the he emphasized the work, the practice. A lot of work. And he was, like, <laughs> he was the tough coach in town that he, you know, really wanted to win. And he yeah. wanted, but he also played the play, played the players and he pushed them to get better. And yeah. he, and he coached them in a way. But anyway, the point was, was that his students, his athletes always remembered how he would make them feel mm -hmm. and how people we're able to look backwards and kind of fear being with him to some extent in, in the beginning, but then how much they accomplished. And I mean, yeah. that was kind of getting unloaded at his funeral. I mean, it was just, it was amazing how people were talking about that. Well, isn't it interesting too, that it often, it often takes till that moment to hear some of those stories. Right. Yeah. The, the, you know, and one of my, this is probably, well, it's at the beginning of the film. This is my favorite Fredism. There is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. Yeah. I mean, just think of that responsibility. And if you just remember that every time you bump into somebody, not just somebody you have resonance with, like we do, but like somebody who maybe is grumpy or who is just doing their job or what have you. Right. Um, but just the impact, the one to one, the personal impact on growth and development that your dad had with coaching. I, you know, I just think, you know, you, to your, you, you can't imagine, I couldn't have imagined at any point in my life prior that I would meet a beloved children's television icon and that he would help catalyze something that was already native in me and sort of launch me forward. You just can't know. And that, you know, that's just one guy. And I think we yeah. all have that as the point. And if there's any takeaway from the movie for me or from my relationship with them, it's that it's like, we got to show up for each other. This, that's yeah. the whole thing. It's the, like, I don't think anybody's, you know, since you, since you raised loss, um, part of my catalyst this year, uh, two dear, dear male friends, pals of mine lost their dad. You know, um, I lost my uncle, uh, two years ago. And every time there's a loss like that, you invariably hear the refrain. I would have spent more time doing X. 
right? Yeah. Whether it's with so-and-so or doing such and such. And for me, reading your book and your story has a quality of this, like, time is short, life is precious, let's get moving, people, you know? And I just wanted, I just want to eke out every inch of my time here in relationship with other people, you know, my wife, my kids, my friends, my colleagues. I don't know what else there is, you know? Um, it's just what makes the world go around for me anyway. <laughs> I love it. That is so great. So where can people find you and learn more about the film and what you're up to now? Yeah, I mean, the simplest place, my name is my address, you know, benjaminwagner.com. Um, it's all there, the music, the movies, uh, the podcast, um, with, uh, my most luminous guest yet, uh, you, um, you know, Yay! so it's all, it's all there. Um, uh, and it is it, sort of full offering of, of who I am and the things that I love to do. And you know, I'm really focused now on, you know, collecting and sharing these stories of transformation so that I can help individuals and institutions like transform themselves. Right. And maybe in small increments, make these neighborhoods, make our world, you know, a better place, a kinder place, a place where we're looking out for each other, lifting each other, bringing each other along. Seems like a good use of time. Yeah. His, your podcast, friends and neighbors is so friends and neighbors show.com. You can get it at benjaminwagner.com. Sign up for the newsletter. I mean, you know, I'm all in. I, I, I will take every form of communication and connection I can take, I can get. I absolutely love it. So, and also go check out if you haven't already, Mr. Rogers and me. And uh, thank you so much for being oh, man, on. My pleasure. And thanks everyone for listening. Uh, if you like this podcast episode, please subscribe and give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite platform. And we are here every Monday and Wednesday. Uh, and definitely, if you haven't already, check out my book, which debuted in uh, the end of October of last year, Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, uh, which is lots of fun and a uh, big journey. And I just want to add that uh, uh, your book was um, a real catalyst for me. Um, and Thank I you. will, I will simply say that at some point uh, I will be calling back because um, well, it was a huge inspiration and helped me to see some of the work that I wanted to do next. So, so thank you. Yeah, I love it. Well, that's what I hope to do is be able oh, to help it. people, in, inspire people to go and do what they're supposed to be doing. So I absolutely love you for saying that. So great. And yeah, that that is uh that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. We will hopefully. uh get to entertain and educate and inspire you you all again very very soon so thanks everyone 